So, who has a problem right now they need to have to talk on, or wants to talk on, or knows of other people in your area that have problems that wants to talk? I just would like more, maybe, conversation about things that you can say to, like, I know when I get back, people know, a few people that know me know that I was going to come here, uh -huh. and when I go to my beat club, they're going to want me to speak on it, and I'm going to be really nervous about, even though I feel confident in my beliefs, I, that, there's nothing that I'm nervous about with that. I am just confident, not confident in my expressing it to them in a way that, you know, might open a little door on their closed minds. Well, then by asking it with people with basic questions as, as the bees and different things, you'll have a lot to take home. I think so, so what point do you want to make with them? Okay, how do you recognize by the observation that your bees are in a necropollen dirt? Observation of the, of the hives, of the strands of the hive. What do you looking for? I have to look at what do I see? You know, what do I want to see? To know that they're, you know, that they're not bringing the pollen, or that they're not bringing the nectar. What observations that you see as a bird in the hive that's going to take and hint to me that maybe I might begin to begin to be in a little trouble here because, uh, you know, do I need to open feed or what? You know, you know, what, you know what am I looking for to make sure that you know? I mean, I see pollen coming in. I see nectar coming in, but I'm beginning to see, you know, you know, you know, but there's some, there's a problem that you can develop. A lot of it's how much pollen and how much nectar is coming. I don't know, you tell me. I mean, if there's a lot of traffic, when they're, when they're coming and going with a purpose, when there's a flow going on, you'll see them, they're, they're flying straight out and they're flying straight back. They're, they're flying the with a purpose, stops. there's there's stuff out there. The flow is stopping, how do you recognize when the flow is stopping? Um, well, that traffic I, starts to let up. When I would ask, why are you worried about when the flow is stopping? You just had a wonderful flow. Um, you know, that's not the time to worry. That's the time to count your blessings and, if, if anything, <coughs> pop the lid and take a look at how things are going in the supers or, or, or see how they're doing. That's the absolute worst time to worry about it because you just got done with the flow. Yeah, but like, you know, eventually, then we get to a point where they're going to begin using the pollen up and the honey up. If they need enough stored up. And that's why they store it. Um, so the last thing I want to do in a dearth is try to feed them if they've still got stores because then I just set off robbing and I've just created more problems. So I, I, don't, I don't want to feed them in a dearth so as long as they just had a good flow and they've got plenty of food and they've got plenty of pollen. I'm not really too worried about it. So you may not feed them from, let's say, uh, mid-June to August? No, I never. Feed I would. Them. I would never feed. I've them. never fed them for. The, o the only time I would feed a colony is when I put that package first into a hive. If I didn't have a frame of honey to give it, I would consider feeding it to keep it from from dying overnight. Because our nights in April, when we get packages, can still get down to freezing. And if a colony without any food, zero, because I just put a package in a box of empty frames, is likely to die on a cold April night. Other than that, um, if they've got a frame of honey or two, you know, they're good. If they've got two frames of honey, they're better, you know, so they can cluster between those frames. A package, three pounds of bees will fill maybe three or four frames in between there. Hopefully, if you have frames of pollen to give them, great. But that's the only time I would ever really consider feeding because otherwise, they feed themselves. They're great for doing that. Let's get this gentleman. Uh, it sounds like you're talking about critical mass here. Somebody beginning out getting a package doesn't have anything you know they don't have drawn comb they don't have coat frames uh full of honey yeah. and, and that's a big a big issue and that's why nobody should start off without some mentoring and without some assistance from a, a known beekeeper i went through what he's talking about last summer i saw my stored away honey and uh and uh pollen disappearing yep. mm -hmm. okay one thing you have to bear in mind is when you look at the highs if you got this much bees and there's practically no honey 
You cannot go out and get fresh nectar or pollen if you can't put honey in your gut so the bee can fly out and get it. So you have to have a basic there at all times for a backstock so they can put something in so they got something in their gut so they can even fly out to get new stuff. So going back to your question of how much, what should you look for? When I open that hive after a nectar flow, uh, the first thing I look at is, is there brood? If there's no brood and I don't see a thin layer of a couple cells of pollen and I don't see some layers of, ne of nectar, then the next question is how many bees have I got then is there capped honey? If there are lots of bees and they're not much capped honey, uh, then they're going to be short supply. In which case in the middle of summer I will probably feed them honey only uh, because I don't want to encourage brood making because there's no food out there. So I'm kind of piggybacking all this on all this because you're in Florida, yeah. I'm, in, I'm in Georgia, you're in Texas, so we're in that sort of southeast where I think we have a big nectar flow and then by about mid-June, once it gets hot, then we go into dirt. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> Excuse me. And then we have a bump in the early fall with the asters and um, golden red and more. Um, so, I had a friend who had a new hive this spring, and it was hot, it was wonderful, it was alive, it was a queen with the biggest booty I've ever seen. And I went and checked with her about every three weeks, not, you know, all summer long. Everything was great, everything was great. They had lots of stored honey at the end of the flow, and then we went into the dirt, and obviously they were eating it, and they were moving things around. Still great, everything was good. Everything about it was good. Great brood pattern. Then um, around mid to late July, a few small high beetles got in there, but it wasn't anything that we couldn't pop. Um, I tried beetle blasters, they didn't work. Um, and then they stored a little bit more honey, tons and tons of pollen, Beautiful, beautiful pollen, goldenrod pollen is gorgeous. Um, and by the end of September, they absconded. What happened? I've heard a lot of reports like that this last two years. I've never heard a lot of reports about like that. They ate previously. all their honey. They I don't left know. a little bit of pollen, and they left. So and they were perfectly healthy. <laughs> What really happened, I can't give you categorically. Some of the pointers I can point out to you is when your hive becomes a bit weak, and what do I mean by that is you don't have enough bees to protect all the comb that is in there, your beetles, moths, and things like that are going to start moving in. So around about June, I'm taking off supers. And we only had two supers on all summer. Well, then we could go down to one. Yeah. Uh, so the first thing I'd say, if you've got beetles coming into your hive, your hive's weak, in which case you've got to take off, take out some real estate so the beetles, so the bees can protect what's there. There was literally, there would have, there would have, they would have, they would have swarmed if we would have taken off this top super because there were so many bees in there. Alright, then you leave that on. The next thing I'd look at is where's the water supply? They have a uh, little pond right next to them. Okay, if there's water next to them, that's fine. So that's the next thing I'll think about is what water. You said they got pollen in there, but they didn't have nectar. They ate it. They ate what they had. So they ran out of food because they need both carbohydrates as well as protein. Right. And your nectar or honey is your carbohydrate, which they're going to need. So they if you've got... All the honey they from the nectar. Then you have to start feeding. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask a little different question because I'm not sure we're, we're even talking about the right thing. You, you said they absconded but you didn't see them leave the hive. No. So, I, so you, you came for an inspection and found there were no bees in the hive. She called me. She called you and told you. How long it had been at that point since you had last inspected them? I had last inspected them um, probably <coughs> two or three weeks. However, she goes out there, she would go out there. <coughs> Every day? Okay. I mean, she doesn't open the hive, she just goes and... Yeah, well, and so I want to know, the last inspection you did before this hive was empty, what did you see on the frames? I saw very little honey. No brood? No brood. No brood at all? Well, it was the typical, I shouldn't say that, there was brood, but you know, they, the queen lays less and less brood as it's getting colder. There were still drones. 
some. Well, at that point, I mean, we're talking about in the fall when it was just after goldenrods and after asters. So this is in September, or October, right? Mm -hmm. So a healthy hive really should still be raising enough brood to have winter bees to have a cluster for winter. Uh, and the reason I ask is because a lot of times people will say my bees absconded, right? Well, what do you mean they absconded? Did you see them fly away? And absconding is like a swarm, except all the bees, all the bees, 100% of them up and leave as a cluster, as a group from the hive. And a lot of people will look at an empty hive and say, oh my gosh, my bees absconded, but not have the information leading up to that to understand whether they really absconded or whether they just slowly died off because there was no fresh brood over the last two month period. So knowing how much brood was in the hive. Now you said there was brood. There was, was that. Was there any brood in the hive when you inspected it after the bees were gone? Mm -hmm. So there was no capped dead brood in the cells at all. Yeah. And okay. In the in the hot part of the summer, in, in the fur, in the early summer, they were doing a lot of bearding, and she was afraid they were swarming. And I actually came by every couple of days because I wanted to make sure they weren't. But really, they were just bearding. So. There were, and they were changing, there were that many bees hanging around outside on the front porch, or, you know, whatever. Um, so I asked her again in the fall, um, I asked her some questions to see if I thought maybe they were fixing to swarm, as we say. And um, uh, she said no, there were no, no bees on the outside that I had no practice. Yeah. Um, you know, swarming or anything. They were literally just gone. And they were beautiful and healthy looking. Okay, how did you keep the brood in the hives versus the honey? Did you have honey in one box, one area of brood in another? Were summer taught to put all the brood in one box and honey above? Or how was that done? Because if it, things get too hot and then there's a lull and you don't have your honey each side, there's no regulation, and if it's too hot, they're going to go to another spot where it's cooler and, and, and they can work. Well, it was cooling off, and there was, um, it was, a, it was really, everything was normal. Um, what do you mean normal? When I say normal, I mean... There was, all were, her, was all her brood in one box? No, it was, it was up into the center <coughs> box, um, but it What was, do you mean center box? Was it me, all it seven. Second box. Second. Um, so by at the what I would call the peak, the middle of summer, which the which was the end of the nectar flow, but the middle of the summer, hottest part of the summer, there she had brood nest in a cluster in both supers, and they were medium supers. I'm thinking I we should put a, we should put a third box on, and we did. It's sounding like it. Yeah. Plus, was was there honey on each side of the brood? Yes. And, and lots of frames that had the typical capped honey in the corners, pollen, and then brood. But then it ran out of honey. If, if well, if it well, ran out of honey, that, then it probably overheated. And if, and if there was no honey in the hive when it was inspected, the other question I have is, what was the condition of the cells? Were the cells where there had been honey before, did they look tattered like they were chewed open or they were just normal uncapped smooth I cells kept all the, i kept all that all the frames, frames i kept all okay. that home because and, and i'm just i'm just trying to maybe distinguish between a, a hive failure and and it being robbed out and the bees absconding because all is lost here versus um no, we found something else in the road, you know yeah the, Typical ones that come up after. So here's another question for you. This isn't the only hive you were managing through this period of time. Tell us about the condition of the other hives that you managed during this period of time. Fine. How many boxes? How much stores? Um, they were they were using stores too, but they didn't run out and they didn't abscond. Yes. And and these are the Hawaiian queens. I bought two Hawaiian queen uh, noofs last year. And this is what they were. And mine got a little more shade. So I'm on to what you're thinking, Dee. Mm -hmm. Mine got a little bit of afternoon shade. Um, and 
At the time, I can't tell you why, but at the time, I opted not to put them on, uh, on I would say, a honey super, but um, a third box on top. Um, but I don't remember why. I just, I, what I can tell you is my judgment at the times, I didn't add a third box. Mm -hmm. um, and they, mine are busting out, and I added the super already before I left to come here. Yeah. So two sister, whatever, queens, um, same, from the same um, company, and hers did not have all day sun, but it had a lot of sun. It had a lot of, mostly, Mostly full sun. So, overheating, maybe. Yeah. Well, when you're down and south, and too. And then, but you talked about brood, but there's kind of three stages of brood, right? A, larvae, and cat. Was it all three? Or was it just cat brood? Well, the brood, right. yeah, we saw all kinds, and we saw brood in all the stages. Yeah. Everything about it was fine until fall. If, if there's a ton of bees, and all you saw was just a few rims of honey. <coughs> we had full. We had full cap. How many full cap frames? Not were? a whole. Not a whole super. It should have been at least probably three frames per full box of bees. Yeah. If it wasn't and it's boiling over with bees, and it didn't have enough nectar coming in to keep them, coming, <coughs> they'll run out of honey. Then they'll start cannibalizing the brood. Mm -hmm. And they won't swarm when there's no nectar flow or honey. They need the honey to swarm. So you could think it's going to swarm because it's full of bees and think you need to give it room, but really we should have probably fed it because yeah. it'll run out of honey really fast. Like yeah. I've seen two boxes of bees go to three frames of honey in less than a week. Yeah. And so, so if there was no sign of robbing, but there was no honey, in the cones, I'm guessing it would start. Well, when they ran out of food, then the hive essentially was a box of empty frames and bees, and with the hot sun beating down on it during the day, there's no way they could thermoregulate. In the okay. end of summer, too, it's a shut-off time where mm -hmm. everything does shut down the brood. The, adult, the adults are still eating, but there's no honey and stuff to restart it. Yeah. So looping back. So let me back to what he said. So, what happened was that during our nectar flow, yeah. they did not collect enough honey. Yeah, yeah. They, they, had, they, they should have been packed with, with more frames, which is why <coughs> I'm always telling constantly on the organic list and the other list that I oversee, you've got to have three on each side because it takes, a, for the adults, you got to have... A, a cell of honey, but for each cell of brood, you got to have another cell of honey. So that's a two, two to one ratio. It's not a one on one ratio. So where most people think you have to have this for brood, you better have that for double. And then for backup for dirt, you better have a triple. And this, a lot of people don't do that anymore. And this was a it. this was a brand new this was a brand new start, right? Yeah. Yeah, so it was a brand new startup, and this is the challenge that a lot of beekeepers have, is yeah. you don't have drawn comb, right? You're starting bees on empty frames. You start them during the good time of the year when there's lots of nectar and pollen coming in. You, get, you only got two boxes drawn out, and you got a little bit of stores, but not enough to get through the dirt, they really had, is what happened. They had some drawn comb, <clears throat> but I'd say maybe yeah, yeah but, 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 but we're talking about critical size here, and, and I think you have a classic... Yeah, you have a classic case of a colony that, if, if you had started that colony on two medium boxes of drawn comb, they would have built up a lot stronger during the flow, probably stored a lot more honey, and probably would have had a better chance of getting through. Well, I'm thinking I should have slapped another super on there. That's what it sounds right, like. Right when they get good. When the conditions were good, yeah, and they might have a had a chance. You see, just, I'll come back to you now, Marshall. The other thing to think about is, you got a new hive that you set up at the beginning of a flow. It's taken them 28 days before the foragers are out, new foragers are out fetching. Mm -hmm. So they've lost 28 days of nectar collection, so they don't have a lot of stores. Well, that's an issue where I live because we don't, if you're going to buy a package or a new, you're not going to, like, they were so late last year. And that's why I bought Hawaiian Freeze because I, I, I got them in March, mm -hmm. which still, 
Our nectar flow has been on since January 21st. My peach trees blew up this year. It's, it's, so it's like, it's just such a crazy game right now with the climate too. Yeah. So, but thank you. No, I, I think that's a great example of the kind of things that happen to first-year beekeepers yeah. all the time. And they end up really failing to understand what happened and why it happened. And, and I think it, it happens a lot more. And there's, you know, we still don't know exactly what happened, but yeah. the evidence suggests what could have. Yeah, you spoke like a true science. Well, <laughs> you, 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 you have to, Joe, Joe. She has to feed the adults, she has to feed the brood. Plus, if she's drawing wax, you have to have extra honey for drawing that wax, too. So that's a three-way three thing, and, and yet there's still no honey for storage. In my so, case. So, Dee, you talk a lot about fill back, and I know you, I mean, I don't know, but uh -huh. I have been to your place, but I have this vision that in your garage or your shed, you have like 10 freezers, and they're like all full of homes and I don't do that. I don't do it. I never have done But you have enough hives. You have enough hives so that you can take two. I always take from the strong and make sure that the three deeps are all, at least the second and third box, the outside frames are always three frames on you. Then I got pollen, then I got the four center. So I got six frames of food in each second and third box filled to capacity at all times. <coughs> You know, the other conclusion that I draw from your example is that your location is just a bad place to start a package in March. When your flow starts in January, you should be making splits from your strong overwinter colonies and instead of trying to even start a package without any resources. A package without any comb, without any brood, in some situations is just a bad place to start. Now, Solomon is probably going to say, don't start with a package at all, but I'll let you talk now. Every location is a bad location to start back. There you go. <laughs> there you go. Marshall, you had a question or comment? Uh, yeah, as we were talking, um, you mentioned some, some ratios, or you mentioned some ratios for overwintering and then before that. So two frames of honey to one frame of brood. Okay, it takes... Okay, the old ratio was you have to eyeball your bees going into winter. Okay, and then you look at what is there for stores. And then you look at what is there for brood. But it's one cell of honey to one cell of pollen to make one new bee. But on top of that, you have to have an extra frame of honey to feed the adults overseeing, doing nurse bees duties, to use that one cell of honey to one cell of pollen to make one new bee. So it's two honey to one pollen to a uh, cell of water for making a bee. And then for backup storage to get through dirts and do the uh, temperature alignment to keep it so it doesn't get too hot or too cold. Uh, while they're all eating that and living, there is no stores in the hive because you've got one cell of honey for the adult that's eating daily, one cell for the bees you're raising, and then you still got to have storage. So, so think about it. And a lot of people don't think those ratios out and then say, <coughs> Okay, for the life of a bee is so long, well how long will that last in winter eating versus shorter, like uh, the, uh, at the most, what, six weeks, eight weeks in the summertime, and you've got to lay all that out and do all your math calculations to see what's there to get your hives through, which is why you were always taught, you always work with three deep hives that were always solidly packed with honey pollen and then the for center was always for brooding. And yet, where was it taught? Because nowadays they're working with little miniatures that have to be constantly fed because there's no backup stores. And if they're going to get up to adult size, they've got to keep eating and eating and eating, which which takes a lot more stores. And then if they have to draw a comb out, that, that, that's more honey yet to get the wax glands going. 
So they're compounding it, ma making it harder, which is why having drawn home is like having gold to put into a hive. Mm -hmm. I, I think it's good to know that if you're starting a new hive, whether it's a nook or a package or a swarm, if you have honey, why wouldn't you help it? Why wouldn't you feed it? If, I mean, if you have other hives, it's real steal from the hives if you've got some honey left over, back for you. I mean... Well, that's what the Robin Hooding used, used to be about. The strong always helping the weak to go on. I think people have a hard time understanding that. But now it's the strong taken from the weak to fill their pockets more? That's not the nature. Gentlemen, then back. A bunch of socialists. So, yes, sir. Uh, what about foundationless people? Uh, if you're going to harvest your honey, uh, that that's more honey yet. That that's, they cannot draw. You're you're putting back empty boxes. Yeah, that takes more honey yet to get the foundation was drawn out to even have wax to even make root or be able to go out and do anything. So when yes, you feed that, back, I'm not, when I put an empty box back, it's an empty box <coughs> with foundation, with a drawn comb in it. So when I spin out the honey, that empty, that wet honey, that wet comb goes back into that hive again. See, that's not a function of foundation, that's a function that you're not extracting. Well, if you're not extracting also, if you're doing comb honey. Yeah, that's because you're not extracting. Not because you're doing foundations, but right. yes, if you're right. if you if you're harvesting the honey, either crush and strain or comb honey or whatever, then you don't have drawn comb and that but that does set them back more for two reasons. That they not only have to draw some comb, but like he said, you give them wets back, that tends to stimulate them a lot because they're cleaning that up and it tends to get them putting it away and I, I, it has a very What's stimulating effect on What wets? What did you say? Wet, wets. You wet, wet wet on, super. Even on hives that need honey, it stimulates them to go out and look for it saying, where did this fresh stuff come from? <laughs> and they'll fly around, but then they got the fresh honey in the wets for the ones that need it to go out, and if there's a bloom going on, then they start bringing it home. The, the biggest warning I give to people who are harvesting all of your comb, like top bar hives, or you're mm -hmm. doing cut, crush and strain, is is be uh, conservative because you, it's real easy to think we're in the middle of a flow, they're putting stuff away like crazy, I'll just harvest all this honey, and then poof, the flow's over, and now they have no honey, and they have no comb to put it in. Plus they and, have no comb and, to brood. and it's really difficult to get them to redraw all that comb before winter and get them back, you know. So mostly, I think it's just a question of being, be, I always think in terms of, I never want to take more than what they need to get through the winter. And if I never take more than what I think they need to get through the winter, I'm usually going to be pretty good, you know. So if I'm, if I'm doing crush and strain, I might buy with a little bit more if I'm doing extracting because just putting the wets back on they clean that up and that's a couple of frames of honey right there you know and then and then I could if I get desperate and that fall flow fails I could feed them something or steal something from some from the strong and give it to them but but I, I just have to be more conservative when I'm doing crush and strain and I did crush and strain for 20 some years so I, 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 I understand that now I have an extractor which is nice I'm glad, I think I did the right thing. I waited until I could afford a nice big one that was really efficient and, and, and I got a good price on it and I'm happy with it. But, but you just got to think a little differently when you're doing crush and strain. But. Follow up my situation, I do a ton of removals. Right. I have so far hung all the brood that I could, hung any of the honey that was in good solid comb. But all the rest of the comb I've just thrown in to be melted. Mm -hmm. uh, it sounded to me like maybe I should value the good quality empty comb from those cutouts and stock it back to uh, yep. well, help small, some of these. Yeah. Well, well, the smaller stuff, if, if you've got the real small comb, especially the darker stuff, that's like gold for as, uh, the east <laughs> domestics that are too big to instantly size them down so you don't have to buy them any supercell. You just put it in and they roll. Honestly, that's not what I do. I do a cutout. I this question if you're, if, excuse me, go ahead. Uh, well, when I, when I do a cutout, I, and especially if it's in a, I don't have small high beetle issues, but if it's in an area where there are small high beetle issues especially, um, I'll throw away about half of the I'll throw away all the drone brood. I'll throw away about 
half of the rest of the brood. I'll throw away all, I'll harvest all the honey. Or, well, I usually don't because I don't trust them not to have sprayed it. But, um, so I end up just throwing it away usually, but feed it to the chickens or something. But, um, but I, I, I don't try to sell, I try to have, make sure I've got enough bees to cover the comb really well and, and have a good density of bees to get them going again because they've been totally stressed out. If I give them too much comb to guard and take care of, they've already got enough to worry about just trying to get going again. Okay, with small hives, 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 beetle, it only became a problem when in uh, Africa. All, all I know is people don't cut out some small hive beetle areas have when, major when, issues. When they went above the 4 7 size, above the medium 4 8 size. Because the adult bees that go in to lay for reproduction or for food and that, uh, their, their exoskeleton is too big to get in 4 4 7 or smaller. So, so your four seven cones up till about four eight, where you cross the line, like like your four nine, uh, you don't you don't have enough reproduction to worry about because they're outside foraging. All they're doing is taking stuff off of the bottom. Well, let's, let's go back to your comb. Could you salvage some more of that comb? Maybe if you get big big enough chunks that it covers, you know, half to three fourths of a frame's worth, I might be tempted to cut all that empty comb and. And put it in the freezer for now but don't give it to them because they're stressed right. out enough as it is and then after they kind of get rolling again then tie that into some frames and give it back to them because yeah. i i yeah i like that you know it tends to be small comb it tends to be yeah. it tends to have a lot of uh, the, the stuff that you can salvage has cocoons in it which gives it a little bit of strength if it doesn't have cocoons in it it's just right. I to, I, it's toast especially if it's got honey in it it doesn't and it doesn't have cocoons in it. it's just toast Yes, sir. Okay, yeah. This question of, of crushing and straining, that, if that, stra that wax that's left, if it hasn't been mashed and really stripped that honey out, if you left it as loose wax, will, and you give it back to those bees, will they reuse that wax no. again? Will they reinstall it? Not really. To no. they'll, they'll take a few little bits once in a while. You see a bee take mm -hmm. a few little bits, but it's all still there in a month. The, the good thing about it, I found the bees will take cappings quite easily as long as it's hot. And it's soft, but the bulk of the comb they leave alone. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to be taking uh, possession of two nukes here pretty quick, and I do have some very good drawn comb. So I presume if there are any, I should put the, the nukes in a, in a regular, I'm going to use eight tray boxes, and put my drawn comb on either side of it so that they can. My, my view of drawn comb is you need, you need to view, yes, it's valuable, but the place for drawn comb is in a colony with the bees. It's not in the freezer. It's not in the garage. It's not someplace else. It, it, as long as they have any use for it, they should have it. Now, if they don't have a use for it and we're trying to manage space because of small high beetles or wax moths or whatever, that's fine. Pull it off. But, but yeah, if I'm installing a package and I have drawn comb, I'm giving them all the drawn comb I can get or a nuke. Well, especially you know, with a nuke package because... You know, if you've got a big, strong colony, right, three deeps or more, and you throw a couple empty frames in it, anybody who's watched that happen, it draw it out in days, right? But if you take a five-frame nuke, how long does it take a five-frame nuke to draw out a new frame of comb? Sure, I'll tell. It, I mean, it just doesn't happen. And so you could be sitting on five frames, and then maybe uh, maybe in two weeks with a good flow and good conditions and good temperatures, you might have six frames in two weeks. But that nuke could literally double and cover ten frames if you had five frames of comb to give it. Well, I do have that. So well, I need to make sure it's You there. need to make sure and put it in there, but you also need to sure, make sure when you put it in that you don't, you, you don't break up the, the brood nest no, but that you the have. Nest, exactly. Yep, you want to keep them together with the honey to the outside, pollen to the outside, honey to the outside, keep all that brood together, oh, and then let it? them grow out into those extra frames okay. and then oh, work great. Put your smallest comb in the center and then in increments, if you've got the slightly bigger stuff, put it in increments bigger to the sides because the core of a brood nest is always the smallest comb and the queen will always lay in the smallest comb first. And if you keep small comb where you can keep her laying at the fastest pace she can go at, you can double and triple what other people can do just by keeping small comb and keeping it uniformly sized. Yeah. 
The other thing I would say to you is that depending on what your environment is like, is inspect that nuke once you've installed it about a week later and see how many of those frames are actually using it, how many they're not, and whether they're actually expanding. If they are expanding, leave it. If they're not, I would consider taking a few out. Because you better I'm, make sure it's left and right facing. Yeah, yeah. because I'm, I'm, where I am, high beetles is a major problem. Yeah, but that's cell size. Yeah, 4.9, that's the better problem. No. Well, for 4.9, well, you have to have strong hives to yeah. keep them out. Right. But small hive beetles, 4.7, there's not a problem. But your area, you're in a Langstroth area, which is a 4.7 area, so you need to go down about another 0.2 millimeter for no hive beetles. Correct. Yeah. Tell you, you probably don't have small hive beetle issues here. But Make it so what did you say, Michael? I said you probably don't have small high beetle issues here. No. Yeah. No. We're far enough south for four seven in the lower four eight 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 range, but but the four seven range because that's all your southern states. You and the line for uh, takes thirty three percent humidity for them to hatch. So yeah, that's yeah, why you don't have yeah, any problems. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> To your question, we make our own because I can't find it commercially. Yeah, where would I find 4.7? You have to draw their own. That's why you go to the 4.9, they <coughs> go down a 0.2 millimeter, and in Georgia, being in the southern state, uh, once you get your bees drawn on, on 4.9, though, and you're going into 4.8, next round down, they'll keep going smaller. And then where they put the cocoon in, it'll make the inside diameter smaller after a year or, or two, also. Okay. But that's why you learn to keep your older combs and you don't rotate out like they're trying to teach you to do. Because of the treatment, you got to change it every two or three years. Heck, yeah. I've, I've got combs in going do. back to because the 40s from Grandpa because the bees always clean it out and use it. And as long as there's no treatment, so nature loves it. Um, it's good. I used to think that I had lived in the worst place to keep bees, but now I think I have it pretty good. <laughs> no small hive beetles. Um, you know, we have pretty much constant flow, like from the, where I, it's like, boom, there's no dearth. And so one of the things that I am kind of thinking through, uh, especially this past summer, is how to manage like the size, the volume in my highs, you know, with what the bees are working versus the combs that I have available. And so I was, I don't want to take, I would like to leave as much as possible in the hive, you know, because if I take it home, it's going to get broken, it's going to get messed up, right? But, and I, again, I work in top bar hives, so it's a little different. So knowing that, my question is, knowing that I don't have any small hive beetle problems, um, is it, do you think it's okay to just leave everything on there? And, you know, I rotate the combs around. For you have top bar hives. How, how big is the top bar hive? Because a standard top by hive by uh, the guy that came over last. Oh, well. From uh, Africa and stayed with me for, oh. for a month. Uh -huh. uh, Jackson. Uh, he kept top bar hives that were five, six feet long, and he'd have some that were two or three deep, just like working with lanes where they were layered on top of layers. Oh, those, but those were his best hives out of 800 or 1,000 or so that he used for queen rearing and breeding. Yeah, mine are about just under four feet, so they're substantial. So they're just barely making an adult size then which would technically means you need to leave them everything they have because until they're five or six feet long, you'd only take the surplus with the last couple of feet or so, but then you put another whole layer up on top and let them draw it, and then he'd use all that for cut comb honey and stuff for his sales mm -hmm. or for mashing down and then uh, liquefying. You probably so have about 30 combs. More, yeah. Okay. It'd be and okay to leave them since you don't have beetles, but just watch out for moths. Yeah, I haven't had too much problem. Like if I overstorm over the winter, I freeze them first, and it seems to, you know, kills off. Kills them. them. Yeah. yeah. Um, In Colorado, you pretty much just leave them outside. <laughs> they freezes. Yeah. 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 I had giant stacks, giant empty hive stacks sitting out. Yeah. That's what I do. All right. Marshall, you had a question? 
Yeah, I'm trying to avoid pollen patties as much as possible, but if I do need them, I'll make my own. Uh, would you suggest, or do um, I be able to still lay eggs in homemade pollen patties? Yes. Yep. And would you suggest incorporating essential oils into them? No. no. <laughs> well, if, if you're making po pollen patties out of real pollen, what I, what I do if I ever feed pollen, which is only in a failed fall flow, I never feed it any other time, I, I put it in an empty hive. I put a, a screen bottom board down, some window screen on top, well, actually I start with a solid bottom board, screen bottom board, some window screen, and a box, and then I put the pollen on the window screen, because then it doesn't all fall through, because mm -hmm. it'll fall through that number eight hardware cloth on the screen <coughs> bottom. But it needs some air. If I don't do that, then it tends to get moldy. If, if it rains or something and it gets even a little bit damp, it'll mold, there's just no time. So then, then I just have an empty box on that and then I'll cover on it and the bees just go in there and get it. They just roll around in it. And, so you're and then I don't have to worry, but it, since it's dry, there's not enough humidity for the small <coughs> bees or any, or any of that kind of stuff. And, and the bees are working it. And so even if I did get any small high beetles in there, they're not in my hive, they're in the, this pollen. Now, if you're using pollen substitute and you're talking about um, trying not to use it as much as possible. I stayed with a guy once and he said he tried to drink, he tried not to drink as much as possible as he poured a glass of Guinness and three shots of whiskey for his breakfast. So I, my advice would be as much as possible as you don't do it. <laughs> yes, sir. Um, I have, um, I also keep most of my bees in top hives, and I have a really strange hive that it, um, a client of mine had that I manage. Um, it lived for two years, but it never grew more than a quarter of the hive. Maybe at one point in the spring, it hit like a third of the hive, and it would just fluctuate between quarter size, third size. And it lived for two years. We were, and every time I opened it up, they had plenty of honey, they had pollen, they didn't have that much fruit. What would explain something like that? And finally, this winter, Something they disappeared. My client called me like six weeks after they disappeared. So by then it was too late. So where do you live? Really understand? Um, Santa Cruz on the coast, California. Well, there, there can be other aspects of this, but the fact is every colony makes its own decisions, mm -hmm. and what sometimes they don't make good it? decisions, and then All the queen has a lot to do with it. So just from usually from other top bar hives that have swarmed. But mm -hmm. I mean, what did the bees look like? Um, they usually are like a mix, like I'll have some blonde ones and then some darker ones. The, the, the other thing that happens in the top archive is they build, they build a few frames of brood and then they store some honey. And this honey makes a wall that keeps them from expanding the brood nest. Mm -hmm. And if you feed some empties on, into the brood nest one at a time, and then when it's drawn and it's full of brood, then you feed another one in. When it's drawn and full of brood, you feed another one and you can get the uh, brood nest to expand. Because, because it's horizontal, and they, once they store, store some honey, they have this wall of honey, and the queen will go past it. So you have a restricted brood nest because of that. And if you don't feed empties in there, they won't expand it. And if you don't expand the brood nest, you don't build up the number of bees that right. don't really bring in enough food to store any more honey. So they're not really looking to expand at all. They're just using the space they have. Mm -hmm. And bees are perfectly fine in a little tiny cavity as long yeah. as they can do what they need to do and survive. They really don't care. Were they small? Were they small bees? Um, I don't know. Average, I, guess. <laughs> I can't remember off the top of my head. Are you thinking they're like part aphrodite or something? No, I'm just wondering if they were smaller, they may just need less space. Yeah. Okay. Smaller needs more space, bigger. Yeah. Small, actually, small, smaller cell bees have more bees per square, more, more cells per square inch of brood, mm -hmm. and and especially if they're natural spaced comb or narrow frames then they can actually cover more brood. So actually they build up explosively compared to a large cell. Um, so they don't build up slower, they actually build up faster. Uh -huh. That's been really important. Don, you had a question? Yeah, I got a question. There's been other people here that have uh, had bees that have been hit by spray, uh, even mosquitoes or what have you. Uh, is there anybody that has any experience of using ozone on this equipment after we've had details? 
I've read a lot about, I've never had experience, but using ozone to kill off foul brood and to sterilize the equipment. Mm -hmm. I've read several articles on that, but I don't know anybody who does it. I've also read of them using uh, radiation on, on equipment well, to sterilize it. That, I mean, this is organic papers, and uh, I'm curious as to whether something like that would fall on the, on the wrong side of the fence. I don't, I mean, I don't think it, it, it would work for the science. It would be contaminated, which is what you're thinking. Um, mm. I, th I think try trying to neutralize pesticides is not a treatment, if that's what you're asking. I mean, <laughs> I mean sunlight, <laughs> sun, sunlight will neutralize a lot, but it will neutralize certain things. And what sunlight will not neutralize is your, like your fluvalinates that are put in the hives because the sunlight with the ultraviolet lights and stuff only goes down barely a sixteenth of an inch at anything for decontaminating and uh, Well, it's it, nothing it's to be using on the, on the bees or on the... It's just right. on no, it would have to... Equipment. Yeah, it'd yeah. be a chamber that you would pump this gas into with your equipment in it, but I don't know anybody who has a chamber to pump ozone and, or where do you buy ozone gas to even do it? So I don't know generator. if you use an ozone generator. Generate, okay. I don't even know if, if you'd want to do that because what would it do for the beeswax and for, for containing honey or even for keeping your microbes and everything else in balance that have to be there. Well, when, when I've got... didn't want to sterilize it so much so nothing will live. When, when I've had bees get killed from spray, what I've always done is just scrap all the comb and put all the boxes out in the sun and leave them for a year, and then next year I use them again. Yeah, That's but that don't do. work with fluvalinate. Well, but we're not talking about fluvalinate. Nobody's, nobody's spraying fluvalinate. We're, we're, we're talking about your hives get sprayed because they're, they're spraying the, the, for the mosquitoes or they're spraying the soybeans or whatever. Yeah, but if so. that's killing that with spray, what's it doing to the animals breathing it? As, oh, it's as, doing as, terrible as, things, as but that's not... That's, yeah. <laughs> there's no doubt. It's a horrible idea. I, 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 I think that's the most frustrating thing about beekeeping is that people are trying to kill insects. For <laughs> water. They use it for more than that. I, I mean, in Europe, they use it for uh, uh, patients that have had strokes and heart attacks. They'll they'll use it to a, on on the way into the hospital, and it minimizes the damage. Where we don't do that in this country. Uh, ozone has a lot of potential for a lot of things. That's what they're saying. Well, we'll it's... see in the future. Bruce, you had a question. Potential constitution. Sorry, Ken. Ken, sorry about this, Ken. Uh, Shoot it down if it's too off the wall. But, Dee, from some of the things I've heard you say this weekend, you, am I accurate that you've got some apiary, some yards that you don't get to maybe for a year? Since I fell in June of 14, eight foot down the ladder where my honey house was sabotaged, I've got some yards I haven't seen in two years, and that's why Marcus came over from Germany to help me get me through my yards, because he figured in three months we could get through all of them. Well, after one month, he had to go back to Germany because all his hives were killed. So my question on that is, besides physical damage from livestock or whatever, or even vandals, I'm not really seeing that. I mean, there's one or two over in the yards with wind or that, but what yards that were burnt to the ground deliberately run through with trucks and mashed into little pieces where you can see the burn chips and stuff, that is people doing that. Yeah. That's not cattle or wind. But my question is, how are the bees They're in fine. those yards that were They're weren't... fine because I was, I've always worked with most of them are all five feet tall, which is like working in nature with your big cavity standing four, five, six feet. And the bees go up and down eating. Well, if they got all the pollen and honey, they can eat all winter and never stop and stay. They've got room. I can go right now and I can take honey from my upper two boxes 
where they're eating up. But if they've already eaten through your bottom, your second, your third, they're on the fourth, fine, let them eat. It's just that the, the crop, they'll just fill it and go up and down, up and down. And most feral swarms, they'll, they'll tell you, even in all the old books, the queens live three, five, seven years. They go up and down, up and down. You don't force them to, small, to swarm or lose them unless they're in little tiny boxes and three deeps or smaller. So I mean, you're not finding those neglected and that's not an accusation. Just my only problem is driving into the highs and what ones are still strong. They got the weight to them. <laughs> but you're not finding more dead outs in those neglected yards? No. Right now we're I, I did do a drive through. I'm working a lumber right now. I've got maybe one hive over to pick up. Uh, I worked four hives. I got eight boxes of honey, and I'm saying I only got 27 more to go. And then I got to go on to the next one. So you're complaining about heavy use. Yes, and then where it's been two years, I've got to hone it, which means it's. Uh, solid in the top two boxes where they're eating stuff that's stored since honey keeps indefinite. And if I didn't have wax presses and stuff with the double jackets that Ed made, we used to give the information out for free on how to do stuff that other people sell for big money nowadays. Uh, what we got Marcus was, he came in with 26 boxes of honey. He said, we can't extract it, what do we do? I said, well, See these hive tools? That's what the rounded end used to be for. So start honing it. He says, what am I going to do? I said, we're putting it into that double jacketed wax press. He says, why? I says, because I can turn the temperature up to mimic 120 like nature, which is what your smaller uh, five gallon melter bands are for. And it might take <coughs> two or three days to liquefy a big, uh, we want to say four foot by four foot by <coughs> full, but you just wait. But then when it's done and you've got your honey out and it's got the water jacket, then you can kick the heat up like they dance used to do for what melting the wax with where the slum would go down. You know, it would be there, but the wax would come out at the bottom, the slum would be left. And I'm putting that in. I'm having to take strainers to take the slum out, put it in five gallon pails, and I've got five gallon pails to store to stack the process later and burl up bad because 50% of it is still wax yet. I've got the wax out, it's like, but I'm getting the money out, I'm managing to pay my bill, but I'm walking slower because I'm, I'm working with these. And I'm working all with deeps, taking one frame at a time, and you open the highs up, and there's bees in the strong ones all the way up to the fourth or fifth box, because there's plenty of honey for insulation and doing what they want. Mm -hmm. So there's no harm in, in leaving the hive for years yeah. without inspection. It happens but in if nature. you're on a true natural system, and you've got true capacity for matching nature and being in harmony, the, the, the problem with having a bunch of hives and you never get into them is that, that they'll swarm. Some of them will end up queenless. Once in a while you lose a few every winter. That's just winter. So after three years of, of getting into my hives once when Saul came and helped me out because I was in Afghanistan for three years, well, I, got them in, I got in them once. I had less hives, but the ones that were there, were, I still had quite a few and they were still healthy and they were still doing fine. But, uh, but I have less, and there's more high, there's more bees in my trees and less bees in my hives. But, um, but all in all, they're not dying other than when they're not all five, 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 five foot tall or more like mine. Mm -hmm. I mean, because mine are as tall as Most of mine are about like this. But yeah. That's about five, that's four foot. <laughs> no, more like five, eight grain mediums. But oh, yeah, that's right. Cool. Yeah. Do you extract? Okay. Anyway, so that it takes. I, I think we need to get back to your question. I don't know how we got so sidetracked for so long. It takes work to keep no. all your hives nice. curves. Yeah. yeah. You should stay in most of them without work at all. Yeah. But I know, but see, but I know my positions right. My only problem is I have people that come and start working. I'm saying, 
Oh, don't put any of the old plastic back that I threw out to the side to use for uh, bait hives or just to stay there until I can bring it home maybe some decade to, because I can only put them I can use the rest of my life. My own, like I told you, don't put the plastic back, just <laughs> and make sure it stays in the right. But, but if you want to make a case for any of this stuff, I think I'm pretty good at that. I'd be happy to, if we, if we can pick a particular. Yeah, I, actually, I thought that because you have a lot of just like two sentence things that make complete sense. That when when someone considers it, they realize that they're thinking, or they don't realize necessarily, but they should realize that their thinking is flawed about propping up weak hives constantly, and you know being so afraid of you know a few mites, you know mean the end of everything, and they have to start spraying chemicals in there, spraying insecticide on it. Because there's a lot of there's a lot of studies out there now to back up almost any of the statements you mm -hmm. want to claim. Right. If you mm -hmm. want to if you want to talk about not using teramycin or not using fumadil, there's plenty of studies to prove that fumadil makes serrano worse, makes nosema. I mean, makes nosema serrano worse. It it it, it uh, and pretty much nosema apis is displaced. Nos, no, I mean, no, Sima Serrano has displaced no Sima Apis. So pretty much you're using Fumadil and, and, A, and A, you're making that worse without looking at any mechanism, just looking at the statistics. And then looking at the mechanism, we know that the, fum, the Fumadil is killing off the bacteria in their gut that protects them from no, 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 no Zima was the first disease that came on upsizing bees. The second disease is following the Nozema was the foul bruise. The third disease was the chalk root. And after that, there were, the bees were big enough, making enough mites, humans could finally start seeing them with industry-wise, other than the odd uh, researchers here or there that had seen mites all the way back pre-1917, going back 100, 200 years more that was seriously looking. When did the upsizing of the bees begin? Seriously, with the AI groups, about 1904. The, the problem with picking a date is it's kind, of over, it's kind of over a span of time yeah. that that occurred. Right, yeah, as, so, yeah. Can I suggest we take a 10 minute break and come back again and continue? Yeah. All right. Thanks, everybody.